I struggled when I attended seminary. You see, I got the sense from my peers and my professors at that place, at that time, that whoever went to seminary would come out either, either as a pastor, a missionary, or a teacher. And I didn't really fit into any of those molds. So I asked myself, why am I in seminary? Well, the subjects seemed like the right kinds of things I needed to study, but I just didn't seem to identify with the career goals toward which the seminary programs were designed. Perhaps I just didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. It was a crisis of vocation. What I did not know at the time, and I think I'm only now really beginning to understand, is that I was an unfortunate victim of the confusion regarding vocation, which has in inhibited the Christian church for a very long time. So, in this video lecture, I want to help place our understanding and practice of Christian vocation into clearer perspective. I will review and critique uh, the concept as it has been used in different periods of history and today and within different traditions. I will introduce the idea then of forms of life, an idea which I think has lots of potential. And then I will show the relationship between forms of life and monasticism. Finally, I will return to the concept of vocation once more, showing how forms of life, monasticism, and vocation all fit together, demonstrating a fresh understanding of vocation both to and within forms of life by coming back to the my own story once again. If you were a European Christian prior to the 16th century Reformation, and indeed much of traditional Roman Catholicism still uses this language today, vocation would mean one thing a call to serve, either as a priest or a religious, like a nun or a monk. An excellent survey of this approach to vocation is found in the 1914 Catholic Encyclopedia. The very first sentence of this article states that, and I quote, an ecclesiastical or religious vocation is the special gift of those who, in the Church of God, follow the evangelical counsels, namely poverty, chastity, and obedience expressed through either the priesthood or religious life. The article is nuanced, guiding the reader through the delicate process of becoming or, vo or discerning a vocation, all well and good. But the point I want to make is this. In the Roman Catholic mindset, which was dominant in the Christian West until the 16th century, and is still in many places today, one only receives a vocation to professional ecclesiastical positions. This is simply the nature of the term. One is not called to be a farmer or a mother. The role of a farmer or a mother are like default categories from which a call to religious life can be distinguished. A vocation itself is defined by the choice to pursue priesthood or religious life. Such is the traditional Roman Catholic understanding of vocation. Now, Martin Luther sought to change all of that. He was one of the first, if not maybe the first, to use the term vocation to speak of secular occupations. Swedish theologian Gustav Wingren, in his Luther on Vocations, summarizes Luther's position well. I read, In his vocation, man does works which affect the well-being of others, for so God has made all offices. Through this work in man's offices, God's creative work goes forward, and that creative work is love, a profusion of good gifts. With persons as his hands, or co-workers, God gives his gifts through the earthly vocations, 
toward man's life on earth. Food through the farmers, fishermen and hunters, external peace through princes, judges, and orderly powers, knowledge and education through teachers and parents, and so on and so forth. Through the preacher's vocation, God gives the forgiveness of sins. Thus, love comes from God, flowing down to human beings on earth through all vocations, both spiritual and earthly governments. For Luther and many Protestants who followed, our vocation, our calling in the framework of God's plan on earth, is not limited to people making vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, but rather it is expressed in the ordinary offices of life. Merchants, teachers, parents, and yes, clergy, all join with God in our distinct but equal vocations. Now, as the Reformation affirmation of ordinary life joined with an increasingly secular view of things, the meaning of vocation was again altered. Removed from its Christian moorings, vocation degenerated in meaning to simply refer to one's occupation or profession. Thus, we now have vocational training schools to prepare individuals for particular kinds of employment. And this more secularized modern understanding of vocation is the common meaning that we postmoderns are reconsidering today, and that most people, in fact, generally use um, when they speak of vocation. Now, within the modern Protestant world, there's a couple of different unique emphases we want to pay attention to. On the one hand, the Protestant missionary movement in the 18th and 19th centuries made much of the inner perception of one's calling to mission. Interesting enough, this sense of Protestant missionary calling exhibited similar characteristics to the earlier Roman Catholic approach, limited to certain ecclesiastical roles or functions, which were viewed by many as requiring serious commitment and therefore highly regarded by the general populace. So that's the one hand. On the other, I think most generally, Protestants have inherited somewhat of a Christianized approach to secular occupation. And what I mean by that, here you find the target of vocation includes a broad range of acceptable jobs. Carpenter, accountant, mother, physician, you know, things like that, through which we can potentially glorify God through evangelism or through some other worthy service of caring. Or, if you were in seminary like me, then there was this hybrid of the two, missionary, pastor, or teacher. These, then, are the categories and the conflicts we are now navigating today. Miroslav Volf revises the Protestant understanding of work as vocation and grounds our calling in response to the Spirit's gifting. Roman Catholics like Sandra Schneider's since the Second Vatican Council in the early 60s, has, they emphasize God's universal call of all Christians to holiness as the foundation upon which more particular vocations to priesthood or religious life are discerned. More recently, and similarly to the Roman Catholic side of things, Greg Peters grounds any discernment of secular or religious life in our foundational baptismal covenant. Gordon Smith and also Mark Laberton, who both resemble in some sense the principle and foundation of the spiritual exercises of Ignatius of Loyola, distinguish between a primary and a secondary calling. Our primary vocation 
is to live as a follower of Jesus today. Our second callings are those careers, relationships, volunteer opportunities, and so on that function as means through which we live out our primary calling. As I read this literature, I sense three things. Number one, a desire to ground our sense of vocation in God's big plan. Number two, a rejection of any sense of vocational elitism. And then number three, an inclusion of spirit and community as important elements of our vocational discernment. I praise all of these efforts and these developments. But there is one more item that I would like to develop. Laverton speaks of vocation not merely in terms of the employment we do, but he also speaks of our call and money, our call and time, our call and volunteerism. With this language, Mark Laverton has moved beyond Luther's various offices, farmer, prince, pastor, and is beginning to make room for what I call forms of life. Seventy or eighty years ago, most people in the United States lived with two-parent families, working a single full-time occupation, often in the same general vicinity. Whether you lived in the city or in the country, this was the dominant form of life, securing a family, a job, and a location. But it wasn't the only form of life people lived. Some chose to join the military. They lived in barracks on a common base. They were deployed wherever the commander saw fit. Their income, their family life, and more were subject to all of the expectations which their own form of life as soldiers placed upon them. Some people were migrant farm workers, living in towns or cities part of the year and then traveling to the harvests for the rest of the year, sleeping in labor camps and sharing life together as a community of workers. Now, there were also some who chose what they considered to be religious forms of life. Amish families, owning all things together as rural farming communities, or celibate nuns, taking vows of poverty and praying in convents, or missionaries who just simply left the country to share Christ in contexts of forms of life that were very unfamiliar to us or to them. Every once in a while, you could find someone who pushed the normal boundaries of life. They were called beatniks back then, but they were rare. So, what is a form of life? In every culture and in every period of history, society is set up with a finite collection of ways of living that most everybody understands. Human beings live within a generally expected ensemble of practices, sentiments, relationships, values, and so on that are held somewhat in common and provide a sense of identity for those who share them. Now the phrase form of life is used both within philosophy and in history and particularly in the history of monasticism um, and I think this phrase has potential today. It, it, it speaks, the term life speaks of vibrancy, uh, something fluid, changing, becoming something. Now the term form speaks of something a bit more rigid or structured. And that's the ironic tension about forms of life. Boundaries can provide a safe haven or an experimental region within which we can thrive and develop influence. But forms can also squash life into mere conformity. Now, to illustrate what I mean by forms of life, 
let me ask you a few questions. Who is your family? Or who do you consider to be your immediate dwelling community? What is your career? What would you consider to be your primary life activities, your greatest skills, the things that are most interesting to you? What is your life rhythm like? When do you sleep, wake, meet with people, do things? How would you describe your relationship circle, your peeps? Who is most important to you and why? Do you have anybody you would say has some authority over you in some way? Who are your authorities and why do they have that role? How would you describe your estate? What do you own? How are you housed? And what possessions are kept either within your home or elsewhere? What about eating? How often do you eat? What kind of food? How much? We could also talk about travel. How do you travel? How often? With whom and why? What virtues do you aspire toward? Okay. I think you understand what a form of life is. Now, let me explain what a form of life does and why this is important. Now, there's a lot I could cover here, but let me just for the sake of this current lecture um, say this much. Forms of life navigate between practices on the one hand and values and or beliefs on the other. What I mean is that forms of life give meaning to practices, but forms of life also concretize what are otherwise abstract values and beliefs. A random act of kindness is one thing, a single practice. A form of life within which one chooses to make a habit of performing acts of kindness says something and thus communicates much more than one, even one big act of kindness. The idea of inclusion is one thing, an abstract idea, but a form of life within which one habitually makes home a place of hospitality to the least communicates the same idea with profound concreteness. If there is one thing we are learning in our postmodern cultures, and it was explored in the late Middle Ages as well, it is that we speak with our lives. It is said that nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Some surveys of the nuns and the duns indicate that people are leaving faith today because they do not respect the integrity of Christians. Thus, by consciously choosing our forms of life, we intentionally embody Christian values and we habitualize Christian practices in a way that supports the church and speaks to the world. Notice that phrase, consciously choosing, we have a say in our own form of life. Of course, we are inheritors of a range of forms of life given us by our history and cultures. And God blesses the world through any and all of our ordinary offices. But Christians can and they do respond to the character of the world and the leading of the Spirit by developing alternative forms of life. Extraordinary offices? Ordinary radicals? Why not beatniks for Jesus? <laughs>
Furthermore, if we do have a say in all this, and we can create new expressions for Jesus, then we do this with conscious attention to the beliefs and the values of the Christian gospel. Now you see, we are talking about theologically grounded Christian forms of life. And now that you know something of the significance of the forms of life, we are ready to talk about the relationship between forms of life and monasticism. But I suspect you are already tracking with me. Perhaps you've noticed? Forms of life are monasticism. You know where I got that list of questions I asked about our life? The one you saw on the chart? That was my digest from a summary of the tables and contents from about 20 rules or covenants of other monastic-like organizations. Monasticism, other kinds of organizations like that. Expressions of religious and semi-religious life are intentionally chosen Christian forms of life. It's that simple. Think of the Nazarites. Think of those that Jesus sent out to preach. The rules address their forms of life. Eating, traveling, relationship circles, and so on. Think of the Benedictines or the Franciscans. Their rules address how to deal with money, with authority, with the rhythm of life. And yet, by talking about form of life, rather than particular recognized monastic institutions, we can also include Beguines, or Sisters and Brothers of the Common Life, or Moravians, or even lay dispersed organizations, expressions like Iona into our circle, as these groups also explicitly speak of ordering our finances, our relationships, our rhythms, and so on. And furthermore, by thinking not only of matters like estate and career, but also including something like a virtue, or even, you know, even when we think of like relational dynamics, um, we can think of our spiritual relationship and speak of spiritual predispositions. We can now more consider the integration of practice and idea, not only in terms of what we want to do when we grow up, but much more clearly now, we consider what or who we want to be. And of course, now when we begin to talk about that, we're beginning to demonstrate the connections between forms of life and Christian spiritual formation. And this brings us back to talking about vocation. I hope by now you can already begin to see the beauty of thinking about vocation with forms of life in mind. You see, this is not a medieval approach rooted in a hierarchy of institutionalized states. But neither is this a modern smorgasbord of mere employment opportunities. We see ourselves embedded in communities and we can choose forms of life and even alternative forms of life that honor the realities of our settings. We can give place to the leadings and the giftings of the Spirit who guides us into the patterns of housing or eating or having relationships and so on, which can best speak the God in us and which give us the greatest freedom to glorify God with our lives. Yes, how we make a living is part of all of this, yet we must be careful we dare not sacrifice celebrating a life for the sake of making a living. Now, I suspect that most of those of you who are watching this lecture, eh, perhaps 80%, will choose to live some form of life that is very similar to the Christians around you. Your housing arrangements, your rhythm of life, your honored virtues will not really appear that odd, and this is good. No, it's great. This is your 
path to holiness. And it's your path to making God's name great in the world. Now, you may find yourself refining your diet a bit, but you'll still eat three meals a day. You may not pray several, seven formal prayer times a day, but you'll pray before work with a coffee in one hand and a Bible in the other. And you'll be kind to those at work who need you. And you may choose to receive a foster child or to share conversation with people who don't have a home. Who knows what God can do with ordinary human beings? I wonder if maybe 2% of you watching this lecture might ultimately decide to go all the way. It's time to sell the house and go to the mission field. I know people who have done this. I've also known folks who joined monasteries who made the choice to renounce their ties to this world system of money, sex, and power, and have rather chosen lives of poverty, chastity, and obedience. I know people who have made the decision after completing college to move into a monastery and to pray seven times a day, living a rhythm of work, study, prayer, and ministry. And then there are some others. I call them the 18%. Well, I hope there's 18%. I think God is raising up people today who are Christian in-betweens. Not the 80%, not the 2%. What I mean is this. You may decide to live in a neighborhood community, each owning separate houses, yet sharing many commonly used possessions, library books, or your own books, tools, vehicles, and making significant decisions of life together. You may decide to pray privately once a day and meet for prayer twice a day as a family or with a group of friends, and you make this a solid commitment. You may decide that you can survive on part-time employment and you devote the rest of your life to kingdom stuff. You may decide to restrict your diet to foods that are ecologically responsible, nutritionally healthy, and fair trade. An interesting kind of fasting. You may commit to a life of prayer, study, manual labor, and care for people, having a group of spiritual conversation bi-weekly in a web conference for accountability, support, and encouragement. The possibilities for the semi-religious life are endless. But you get my point here. I've talked about the new begins. I've talked about the radical middle and things like that in other lectures. Wherever I go, I am finding people who are interested in, no, hungry for this option. Are there 18% who are interested? I hope so. If you are, let me know. Frankly, getting back to the story I started this lecture with, I think I've always been called to a form of life more than any particular occupation or even role. Even during seminary, while I was struggling with whether I was going to be a pastor or a missionary or a teacher, Sherry and I knew even then that we had a vocation to some kind of simple life. We knew we were called to at least three times of prayer daily, that our approaches to housing and more were going to look different than some of our peers, and that we, even though we might never join a formal missionary organization, or a monastery, or even some kind of intentional community. Had I known then that the Spirit of God was inviting me into a vocation of exploring semi-monastic forms of Christian life, it might have made things a lot easier. But now I know, and I'm learning to live into this vocation, even though sometimes there are parts of me that still look for meaning elsewhere.
Which are you? The 80%? The 2%? The 18? I want you to know that no matter who you are, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. I've spoken more to the 18% because I think that they have received the least attention in history. And also because this is where I feel led and I think God may be doing something. My hope is that perhaps in part because of this lecture, you will pursue, no matter what percent you are, a life with a big vision of vocation. A vocation that includes a call to occupation, to relationship, to virtue, and to a full, all things new Christian life.